Blog Talk Radio. Hello, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, it's been another exciting week. I keep saying that every week, but they are exciting weeks. Uh, nothing gets settled. Everything is in turmoil. But that's life. That is life, up and down, and we have to deal with it and face it, and whatever happens, happens. You may call in if you want to during the course of the show. The number is 646-478-5731. I repeat, 646-478-5731. I am happy to hear from you. You can agree with me, disagree with me. Tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, Or just call to say hello. I am happy to hear from you. I want to start this week with President Obama and Ukraine. What else is on the front page? Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. Let me, I want to make a point tonight. History does repeat itself. If we do not understand that, that history repeats itself, if we do not understand that what is happening today has happened before, it can destroy us. Putin, I'm sorry, Putin, And Ukraine of today, Putin and the Ukraine of today, are the Hitler, Austria, and Czechoslovakia of yesterday. Obama must take a stand, otherwise he will be remembered as the Neville Chamberlain of today. Strong talk by me, the Neville Chamberlain of today. It's out there, it's possible. We drew the line in Syria. What happened? We backed away. It has been drawn several times in Ukraine. Nothing of any significance has happened. You you were cutting off the economics for some of his people, but he's still sending his armies, his people, into Ukraine. Putin's a bully. I'm going to tell you something. I'm beginning to think he's much worse than Joseph Stalin was. Did, does, did not kill as many people and has not as yet killed as many people, but he does a lot of bad things. Obama has to stand up to him. The only way you beat a bully is to stand up to him. Okay? I don't want to tell you what's going to happen if Obama doesn't stand up to him. We can't keep, have another Syria. We can't keep talking and saying he's a bad guy. He's got to do something because if he doesn't, history will not treat Obama well. I The biggest thing he's done is uh, Obamacare. He would go down in history as the first one to bring universal health care to this country. It won't mean anything if he doesn't take care of the Ukraine, Ukraine problem and stand up to Putin. The fact that he saw that Osama bin Laden was killed will mean nothing. You know, that'll be a second place finish. He has to deal with this Ukraine problem. Putin is standing on a hill looking down at our president and saying, Ha, I'm here. I dare you. Talk is cheap. My president is doing a lot of it and his staff and his people. Uh, My country, our country is doing a lot of it. Sometimes you have to put your money where your mouth is. This is that time for our country, our president, with regard to the Ukraine. Now, let's stay with with Ukraine for a moment. Um, Really, I'm going to talk about Putin, not the Ukraine. Now, let me talk about Putin for a moment. Putin, Russia, and Russia. I think Russia and Putin are very, very smart people. I think the Russian people are smart. I think Putin's a brilliant leader. A, A smart businessman might be the better way of terming it. Look what's happening this past week. No one can get along with North Korea. All right? They're the worst. Terrible. We all know this. North Korea owes $11 billion to Russia. They've owed this money for a long time. The Russian parliament this week forgave 95% of that debt. They forgave. 95% of the North Korean debt, and there's about a billion dollars left they have to pay, and they can pay that off over a 20-year period. What a deal. Now, why did the Russian parliament, which Putin controls, do this? Russia wants to build a gas pipeline, 
Remember, 75% of Russia's income comes from gas exports. You can never forget this. We can never forget this, any of us. That is his economic lifeline. Well, Putin wants to build a gas pipeline across North Korea, not for North Korea. He wants to sell gas to South Korea. The only way to get to South Korea for him is through North Korea. Now, North Korea hates South Korea. We all know this. But yet, uh, uh, the, the North Korea is going to permit Putin and Russia to build a gas line across North Korea to help South Korea. It, it has been reported that in May it will be announced that Putin has made an agreement with China, with China, to supply gas to China. And there will be a pipeline constructed somehow to get to China with gas. These are major moves. These are big-time business moves. While in this country, we can't get the Keystone Pipeline approved. It's waiting for Congress. It's waiting for Obama. Obama's been looking at the Keystone Oil Line Pipeline for about four years. Hasn't made a decision yet. And if I recall correctly, he's now put his decision off till after the November elections. Let's stop screwing around. What do we need in this country? We need jobs. Our leaders, the 1%, have forgotten the 99%. The 99% need work. The construction of the Keystone Pipeline from Canada to either Louisiana or Texas across the length of the United States will create tons of jobs, big cash flow. Everyone will benefit. Sure, it ends when the pipeline's built, but there'll still be jobs you have to maintain and so forth. The, the environmentalists are out there fighting this. A lot of people are fighting this. We don't want it in our backyard. It's going to pollute my water supply, uh, endanger my children. Uh, I was an environmental attorney for the last 25 years of my career. I understand all these things. I have been through all these things. I believe in protecting the tortoise, you know, out in the Nevada desert. I, I believe in helping little fishes. I believe that we've got to protect the water table. I believe we can't do anything that's going to hurt people. But the pendulum has swung in this country. When we became pro-environmentalists, People were working and making money. We had a thriving middle class. We don't have that today. We need jobs. When something like that happens, the pendulum has to swing back, my friends, and we have to take certain risks and certain gambles. The pipeline isn't going to be a major problem. Sure, it's going to leak. Everything leaks, okay? And sure, there are going to be consequences, but they're not going to be major, and they can be dealt with. We need that Keystone Pipeline. We can't get it in. Yet Putin is going to deliver oil through North Carolina, gas through North Korea to South Korea and eventually to China. I don't understand this. Democracy is wonderful, but sometimes it screws you up. Let's stay with Putin for a minute. I said Putin and Russia were great business people. Let me give you an example how Putin alone seems to be an astute businessman. You've heard of Gazprom, G-A-Z-P-R-O-M. It's the fourth largest gas company in Russia. Well, Ukraine, you know, the Ukraine, before all this stuff started, didn't have much money as it was. They had trouble. Ukraine owed, two, oh, still owes, $2.2 billion to Russia, to Gazprom, really, uh, for gas they bought last year. They couldn't pay it. So they didn't pay it. Well, Putin wasn't doing anything, you know, give him more credit until these problems occurred with Ukraine. So about three weeks ago, Putin said, no more gas to the Ukraine, he said to Gazprom, because he controls everything. Putin, your company will supply no more gas to Ukraine till the bill is paid. Is this hardball? Okay, but that isn't why he's a smart businessman. This past week, the United States, our country, in what I assume was a humanitarian act, guaranteed payment, guaranteed payment of $1 billion of the $2.2 billion Ukraine debt in order to keep the gas flowing. We said, 
We'll cover the action. Don't worry about it. So Putin said, okay, let the gas flow. We'll work out some other arrangements on the $2.2 billion left. Why is he a smart businessman? Not because of anything I've said so far. What I am going to say now is evidence that he is astute, and this is personal financial gain. Putin happens to personally own 4.5% of Gazprom, the company that supplies the gas. Putin owns 4.5%. Accountants have reported this past week that this guarantee by the United States government is worth approximately $45 million to Putin personally and individually, $45 million. He's not going to pick it up in cash today, but his financial statement just increased net worth-wise by $45 million. And at some point, if things keep going this way, he'll be able to cash in his chips and pick up a ton of money. i got to tell you something. Putin is as smart as our corporate CEOs in this country, and our bank presidents. He knows how to make money, and he doesn't care how he does it. We're going to keep talking a little bit about money tonight, but we've got to talk about food because food is getting very expensive. It's abnormal. I want, I want to tell you something. Whether I'm playing golf or I'm playing bocce or I'm sitting on the beach talking to people or I'm in a bar having a couple of drinks with friends, Everyone talks about the high cost of food today. It enters into every conversation. It doesn't monopolize it, but people make comments. When I'm with ladies, my lady friends, my God, this is a topic of conversation because they're going to the supermarket. They're standing in line and paying at the cash register. Price of food is astronomical, and it's only going to go up. Let's start with limes, those little green round things, limes. Uh you know, when you order even a Coke or a Diet Coke, they, they generally put a little piece of lime on top. Well, they are now known as green gold in the last two weeks. In two weeks' time, the price of lime has doubled and tripled. What cost $36 a case three weeks ago costs $110 a case today. $36 to $110 in three weeks. Why is this happening? Well, limes come from a lot of places one big place is Mexico. Mexico's got a hell of a drought. They got a terrible drought down there. Just as bad, if not worse, than the drought we are experiencing in California. The other problem is the drug cartel. We know there are drug lords and drug cartels in Mexico. Well, there is a war going on at the present time between the various drug lords over control of the highways. Because in order to get their stuff to the seaports and to the United States borders, they have to drive over these highways. So they are fighting with each other over control of the highways. Wars are actually taking place on the highways. And so the farmers can't, can't take their limes to the market to sell. Not safe. Isn't that amazing? So limes have gone up. Uh, several of the bars and restaurants I've been in this past week have stopped serving limes. What happened in the last few days? First it was limed. Now it's oranges. In a matter of days, within the last five or six days, the price of oranges soared. The price of orange juice soared. Now, now, now why is this happening? Well, there is the drought in Mexico because oranges come from Mexico also. That drought is killing everything. We have California oranges. The drought out there is killing the crop. But what happened here in Florida, because Florida is a huge producer of, citri of, of, of oranges, uh, an insect infected <laughs> all of the orange plants in this state. It's called, it's a tiny insect. It's a gnat-sized Asian citrus Psyllid, P-S-Y-L-L-I-D, P-S-Y-L-L-I-D. This little bug has destroyed the Florida orange crop. Worst disease to have, been, to have attacked the Florida orange crop in 30 years. And the prices are shooting up because there ain't going to be enough orange juice. Either way, the consumer gets screwed. Either intentionally by these big agri companies and corporations that control the food today or by an act of God. 
or an act of war between the drug lords. I read an article this past week that was very interesting. It said the price of food will double in the next decade. Over the next 10 years, the price of food will double. The price I, I talked about this on the show two weeks ago. The price of food alone last year went up 19%. That's a lot. You don't realize it when you go to the supermarket. You know you're, you're, you're getting less for more money, but that's almost 20%. That's a fifth that went up in one year. And the reasons they're – I think it's going to more than double. That's what Lewis is trying to say. The reasons that are given for doubling is that they're the drought. There's not just a drought in Mexico and California. There is a worldwide drought. Water is becoming extremely precious, more so than before. We need it to, to stay alive to drink. We need it to feed our crops so we can eat. And global warming is being blamed for it. The climate is too warm, too long. It's global warming, global warming, even though the major corporations say who are causing global warming. There ain't no global warming. There is, and now it's going to affect the price of food, they're saying. And also, this is interesting, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in some regard. We had a big middle class here. The whole world wants to live like the people in the United States live. They want to buy the same things that the people in the United States do. When it comes to food, they want to eat their steaks, their filet mignon. They want the best bananas, the best oranges, the best apples. Uh, they want what we have in our supermarkets here because that's part of being in the middle class. And people in many other countries that 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, were not middle class, have made it in their countries because their economies overall have picked up. And now they are in the middle class and they have money to spend. And one of the things they are spending it on is food. Well, there's only so much food in this world. And we all know it's the law of supply and demand. When the supply, when the demand exceeds the supply, the price goes up. And that's what's happening. And many of these countries, by the way, we, we benefited and helped create this middle class over the last 20, 30 years. It's because they want what we got, and so they are and we are going to pay more for it because there is not enough to take care of all of us. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to stay with food for a minute more and talk about Monsanto, that great fruit, food, food, food giant, the one with all the agri farmers and the big pusher of genetically modified orgasms, orgasms, uh, or, or genetically modified seeds. Excuse me, uh, in our used to grow our food. Uh, and here's how it's going to work. I'm going to talk about Monsanto and genetically modified seeds in Latin America. But before I enter into that interesting story, let me tell you what Monsanto has done for us in the last 20 years. This big company, 20 years, actually 30 or 40 years, maybe 50 years. Here's what Monsanto has given us all alone with no other company helping them. Here is what Monsanto gave to you, me, and everyone else. They gave us DDT. I'm old enough to remember DDT. When I was a kid, everybody wanted DDT. You sprayed your bushes. You sprayed your lawn. You weren't going to have bugs anymore. DDT killed bugs. It also killed people. So much so, you can't buy DDT anywhere in the world today. It is banned universally, but Monsanto gave us DDT. Monsanto also gave us PCBs. I had so many cases with PCBs over the years. Uh, I would run into them where there was, were railroad, on railroad lines. I would run into them where there were ships. And these are toxic chemicals put together. Uh, they did it. Highly toxic. Highly toxic PCBs. They gave us PCBs. Hazardous substance in the United States, by the way. Then comes Agent Orange. We all know about Agent Orange. Vietnam, our soldiers came back. They, they had trouble several years after the war caused by or Agent Orange, which had been invented, discovered, put together by Monsanto for use by our troops with apparently n no uh, thought given to its 
safe, whether it was safe or not. And finally, saccharin. Uh, saccharin, in some circles, is considered a carcinogenic. Yes, a carcinogenic. Uh, and who gave us saccharin? Monsanto. These are wonderful people. Okay. Now we're in, some, we're in Latin America. Latin America, I'm talking from Mexico to the southern tip of South America. Latin America, the whole continent of South America, Central America, and Mexico. There is a major fight going on in Latin, between the Latin American countries and Monsanto over genetically modified seeds. The Latin Americans do not want genetically modified seeds. They don't want, and Monsanto, by the way, has a lot of farms down that area in Latin America. They've been making a ton of money off Latin America, but the people don't want it anymore. They want Monsanto's ass out of their countries. And here's how this thing all comes about. Seeds, all right? Mexican, Latin Americans are strange people. They have, for several hundred years, helped each other. If there are far, two neighboring farmers and one runs out of seeds, he shares the seed with his neighbor. They have been sharing seeds for centuries. They have been giving away seeds to their neighbors and their friends for centuries. Now, there's something called Monsanto Law. It's in the United States. It's in Europe. It's been passed in many states in this country. And it, they're trying to push it in, in uh, Latin America. And what Monsanto Law says, is you can only buy your seed, Mr. Farmer, from me, Monsanto, and when I sell you seed for the first time, this contract you're signing says you will buy all your seed from me for the rest of your life. And, of course, you will not share it with anyone. Well, the thing that should be bothering the people is that they're giving Monsanto an exclusive. They're going to raise the price on them because they got a monopoly. What's bothered the people in Latin America is we can no longer share with our friends and neighbors. So each country has its own war going on with Monsanto, and some want them out of the country. Now let's go to Vermont, and we're going to stay with Monsanto again, uh, which is one of, it, which is the primary company involved with. Uh, genetically modified uh, seeds. Uh, last week, Vermont, they're the first in the nation for everything, I think. Vermont, the Vermont Senate voted. They passed a law that requires any food stuff. I don't care whether it's in a can, a bottle, glass, plastic, vegetable, just the skin, must be labeled that it contains GMO, genetically modified or uh, uh, seeds or what have you, uh, organisms, genetically, I was going to call it orgasm again, genetically modified uh, organisms. And that's the law because the House in Vermont had passed such a law the previous week. The governor is expected to soon sign the law. He has been in support of it. It will go into effect July 1, 2016. And it's good to have that. More of our states should have that. By the way, Monsanto fights this in every state. But I believe, and the people of Vermont apparently believe, that the people have a right to know what they are eating. And if they think something is bad, and most people, maybe all people other than Monsanto employees, think genetically modified items in their food are bad. Monsanto has announced they will fight the legislation in court before it becomes effective. Okay, now we're going to go to water. <laughs> These are all little goodies we need. We need food. We need water. I talked about water earlier in this show. Guess who wants to control water? And they ha there's a movement going on within this industry that I'm going to identify to take over water. And, you know, we haven't got enough water in this country. The banks, would you believe it? The banks who gave us the mortgage recession here in the United States, the banks who have put the rest of the world into recession, just about, they want to privatize. They wish to privatize 
the bank, the water supply. See, now the government, the states in the United States, the counties, the municipalities control the water. They take care of it. They're in charge of the pipelines, the sources, purifying it, chem- putting the proper chemicals in, doing whatever has to be done so we, we can get it out of the faucet here, friends, or buy bottled water, whatever you want. It's taken care of by the government initially, and then it may go to a private industry. But the government's involved. They don't want the government. They says, no, we want private corporations to control water. They will do a better job, okay? Well, let me say to you, the banks screw up everything, and so do the big corporations. They only deal for themselves, not for anyone else. It's the 1% and 99% thing again. And now they want to control the world's water supply when we don't have enough water to go around. That the banks claim public health is at stake. Baloney. Bullshit. Not public health at stake. Money's at stake. They're doing this for money. Okay? And I want to tell you something. High on the list of the World Bank Group is to take over the water supply in this world by privatization. Now, we know there's a water crisis. We know this, okay? And we are told, but the big corporations deny this, that it's being made worse, this water crisis, by, you know, global warming. Why is there a drought in Mexico? Why is there a drought in California? Severe droughts, all right? Do you know that a quarter of the people in this world, these are interesting facts I'm going to share with you. The last one will break your heart. A quarter of the people in this world do not have clean drinking water, clean drinking water, and that more people die yearly from waterborne illnesses like cholera and typhoid fever than, wait, they die more from that than from all the violence and the wars combined. Yes, my friends, more people die yearly here, and the overall number here, I mean the world, is greater than the deaths caused by big-time violence and wars. But the worst thing, the most touching thing I came across is that the United Nations says, the United Nations says that every hour, hear me again, every hour, 240 babies die from unsafe water. Every hour, 240 babies babies in the world die from unsafe water. The banks are going to finance the private companies that are going to operate this thing. Uh, It's really a ruse to control water, and the reason is they want to make money, and that's what's happening, and you should be aware. I'm going to read you a short ditty here that uh, I picked up out of Facebook this past week, but it's very interesting. Uh, And let me read this to you, and at the end I'll tell you who he is. He was a radical, nonviolent revolutionary who hung around with lepers, hookers, and crooks, wasn't American and never spoke English, was anti-death penalty, anti-public prayer, but was never anti-gay, never mentioned abortion or birth control, never called the poor lazy, never justified torture, Never, for, never fought for tax cuts for the wealthiest, never asked a leper for a copay, and was a long-haired, brown-skinned, homeless, community-organizing, anti-slut-shaming, Middle Eastern Jew. His name? Jesus. Cool. All right, we're coming to the end of another show. I thank you for having joined me uh, this week. Remember, I wrote a book. I have to keep remind you. The World Upside Down. It's a, If you like this show, you like what I say, it's a series of essays talking about things like this, political and social happenings. You can find it on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. The title of the book is The World Upside Down. The world fits, doesn't it? The World Upside Down by Louis Patron. If you don't enjoy this program, don't buy the book. You won't enjoy the book. Uh, This show, by the way, is archived immediately and is always available uh, in the archived uh, portion to be heard. Uh, 